as a doctor, you have a responsibility to the patient, right? You have, you took an oath and you have a responsibility for that. So given that the biggest children's hospital in the world was lying to the public about the existence of their transgender program, I um, began to reach out to journalists because I saw what was happening. And, you know, for a children's hospital to do this is, is a egregious violation of medical ethics, something that is unconscionable. Hey there, friends. Before we get into this clip, I wanted to give you a little bit of context because this is from an interview I conducted with Dr. Eitan Haim and his lawyer, Marcella Burke, a few months ago. Dr. Haim is a whistleblower, a, a, a physician here in Texas, who noticed that the Texas Children's Hospital was conducting what's called gender-affirming procedures on kids after the state attorney general deemed these procedures illegal and functionally child abuse. And for that, the Department of Justice has now officially indicted the doctor. The claims and the actual charges are currently under seal, as I understand it, and so he doesn't yet know precisely what he's being charged for. Uh, but one thing is clear. The effort taking place right now is to silence a whistleblower and make an example of him. These are serious matters, and Dr. Haim stepped forward courageously to let Texans and every American know that these hospitals are doing this, they are profiting from it, and they need to be stopped. The Europeans are ahead of us on this, folks. They are banning these procedures in places like the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. The tide is shifting. The College of Pediatricians in the United States just this week announced that these procedures must be stopped. And yet here we are with our Department of Justice trying to silence and intimidate doctors who speak out against it. So I encourage you to watch this clip, check out the full episode and the full conversation so you can really understand what's going on. And if you wanna learn more about what's happening with Dr. Haim and possibly even support his efforts to defend himself, we'll leave a link in the comments below. In the conversation, Dr. Haim lays out what happened when the feds just showed up at his house after blowing the whistle. It was around like maybe like 11, 12, in a, you know, early afternoon and we're getting ready and all of a sudden um, we get an aggressive uh, knock on the door. And I'm like, man, who is this? Like, that's, that's weird. And, uh, you know, I stumble over, I'm wearing some stupid t-shirt and I wish I was wearing something different, but I open the door and standing outside are two federal agents. You know, they say they're with Health and Human Services, they show me their badges and that they're investigating a case regarding medical records. And, you know, I knew it was like a combination of shock, like absolute shock. And then, you know, I knew exactly what they were there about. So, you know, of course, because... How were they dressed? Oh, like uh, button-down khakis. Okay. Yeah. So they weren't like one of these weird federal agents where like there's all these agencies that have all guns and ammo. And it's like, why does the Health and Human Services have guns and ammo exactly? So yeah. they weren't in like jackboot stuff. No, like no. They look like... Yeah. You know, Button-down khakis. Just normal bureaucrat. Yeah. We have had whistleblowers call us and say the FBI has come to their home in gear over the same issue. Yeah. Oh. But not in this case. Like full-on SWAT style. Yeah, in this case, just button-down khakis. Okay. And, you know, of course you freak out. You start making bad decisions. So, you know, I invite them in. We sit down. But uh, once we sit down, my... Why Did they have a warrant or anything like this? Was there some kind of like, what, what's their right to come to knock to your you door? Know, well, and... you know, I had invited them. Okay. Just because we were sitting in the door, I felt awkward, you know. Yeah. Like, right, but they didn't present like, we have a warrant to search no, or anything no, like this. No, no. Okay. It was, uh, so I have invited them in. And then we sit down and then my wife is an attorney. She's brilliant, uh, but she was getting ready. So she comes out from taking a shower and then, um, you know, she sits down uh, at the table and uh, they were just about to start the interview and... She pulls me aside, and you know we're talking. We, they had cameras. Yeah, we we both what knew. Did they, like pull out and like set up a little camera. No, or they did. Yeah, or they something? had like a little tripod thing. I don't know, you know what it's called, but they. It's like a deposition. Yeah, yeah, and you know we go back to our bedroom, close door, and we both were like, not gonna happen, bad idea. So we go out. We insist. You know, we would like to have an attorney present if we talk to you, and then they're like, okay, no problem. So then they give us a target letter, and a target letter, you know, is this piece of paper, and it stated that I was the a potential target of a criminal investigation. And it was signed um, by a assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Texas. We knew exactly what it was about, and then they leave. So, of course, afterwards, after that door closes, 
you know, our, our whole lives have changed. And just to be clear, because I don't understand how all of this works, that person, that district attorney, they're a federal employee. Is that what that is? They're is that UN, right? United States attorney, federal employee okay, of so the Department of Justice. Yeah. So they're in Texas, but they're a federal. federal they're a fed. Crime. Okay. Federal crime. All right. So they're a fed. Mm-hmm. And um, does it say the grounds? Does it say what the cr- potential crime was? It did not. Is, did that, is that how that works? So in these situations, what it could mean, it could mean lots of different things, but it could mean they, they have reason to believe there could be probable cause that a crime was committed. And so they want to investigate whether they can find probable cause, which would then get them a warrant, which could then hold someone for arrest, hold them for trial for a possible violation of the law. And so they could set up what's called a grand jury and they could have an investigation and present the grand jury with information from which they could get that probable cause to get a warrant or to issue an indictment for a crime. And so what the target letter does, you're either, you could be a target of an investigation, you could be the subject of an investigation, you could be the witness in an investigation. They could also just send a request for information. You know, we've had clients call us say, we got this letter with this uh, eagle emblem on it. <laughs> it says it's from Washington and they want this document. You know, what does that mean? It could be, well, they're just looking for evidence for something for a grand jury investigation for someone else. So there's different levels of um, engagement when you get these letters from the Department of Justice. His letter said that he was a target. So unambiguously that they were looking to To achieve probable cause to charge him with a federal crime. But the letter was very brief. And of course, this was a few hours before before my graduation, graduation, before I was meeting my parents. So they had chosen this day for a very specific reason. I mean, that's my opinion that they had chosen that day, that time, for the reason to intimidate. I mean, that sure seems like a pretty cage-rattling tactic. Like, like the notion that that was accidental doesn't pass the sniff test. Yeah, they had rattled the wrong cage because they had chosen the wrong target. I mean, their intention was to intimidate, but, but that was not going to happen with me. What happens next? And at what point do you, is there more information? And I know there's some things because this is ongoing, so I know there's limits to what you can talk about, and that's part of why Marcel's here to help us navigate this. But um, is there some point at which you understand like what they're claiming is the problem? I mean, maybe this is for you, Marcel. Um, you- it's an interesting question, but I'll tell you, I can frame the answer this way. When we got the phone call about the case, most people, if you hear that someone has been being investigated for a crime, the assumption is they did it. And- Do you mean as a lawyer? Just as a human. Okay. And when I got the call, being a human, I was like, what did this guy do? I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not gonna get some dirtbag out of jail, you know? And uh, talking to Rufo and learning more about the case and talking to Dr. Heim, I mean, that's the origin, that's the question. I mean, you, you talk to one another as lawyers and you're like, what's on this guy? Has he committed tax fraud? Has there been some other crime? Has there, is he cheating on his wife and there's some scandal? I mean, is there some th- weird thing he's done? I mean, what on earth did this guy do, right? How do you get the feds um, on you? But we also are living in an age where we just continue to see over and over and over again the federal government maliciously prosecuting political dissenters for an array of issues. And so there's also that possibility. And it's like, could it be that? And is... Performing illegal mutilations on children in that category, I mean, it's just confusing. It's like, is that a political issue now on party lines, really? And so we're having to work that all out as lawyers. And so I'll frame the answer that we've done enough research on Mr. Heim, his family, any possible violation of any possible law based on the information he gave Christopher Rufo and that was part of Rufo's expose and what was happening at Texas Children's Hospital. Is there any conceivable way this could have violated any possible law? And it was a clear no to where Dr. Heim is so comfortable with that, that although he has been received a target letter, he's comfortable coming forward with the story because now, and he'll have to speak for himself here. And, and we knew, you know, I knew there's nothing to it from the very beginning. But of course, you know, it takes time to really be in that state of mind that, you know, like you'll take this story public and like pretty much torch your entire life as you knew it in order to stand up for something you believe is right. And I mean, it took 
you know, it, it takes a lot to get to that point. But when you reach the conclusion that you're being investigated for a political ideology because you told the truth, then there's no other option. Because if you stay silent, then you're going to get destroyed. And we've seen it more over the past three years. These people who become targets for the political ideology, their innocence is not their best defense, right? Their innocence and because they were virtuous, those are the very reasons they're being investigated in the first place. It's because they told the truth, because they were virtuous. Marcella, there's a con this, there's this, this concept of, of being a whistleblower. So educate me on this. What does this mean was Aton a whistleblower legally? And does that, did that afford him any particular legal protections that are meant to allow people to do things like that, like blow the whistle when there's something bad going on? Sure. So a whistleblower is a, is a, is a statutorily protected, uh, basically, form of speech where you would uh, let an authority know of inappropriate behavior going on in an organization so that authority can investigate. And so you're providing evidence, essentially, um, and then you would negotiate with that agency for what your role would be. So sometimes it might be something that you yourself participated in. And so you might say, this is happening. I've done it. I want to admit it. I want to negotiate for immunity. And I'll tell you what's been going on. Sure. Um, it might okay. be, and that can happen with federal government. It can happen in the state government. Um, in Dr. Himes' case, he was not involved in this. It was something he had seen and heard about. And that was just common knowledge, being promoted again in lecture series and across the hospital. Yeah, and even on what sounds so, like internet accessible videos elsewhere, be absolutely. beyond the Texas school, Children's Hospital, right? Yeah. yeah, for like the College of Medicine. Yeah, yeah for, the, for the Baylor College of Medicine. So... Um, so, so the whistleblower stat, but there's a status and uh, based and there's elements under state law, and Dr. Heim met all those, and so. And is that true? Even though you didn't go to the to a government agency, you went to a, to a, a journalist, or I know people will like, well, is he really a journalist? He doesn't work for the New York Times, but. Well, we want to be careful here with some of the background details, just to protect Dr. Heim and the sure. process. But I can tell you that we uh, uh, journalists have certain privileges. And when uh, Dr. Heim went to the attorney general, he was a uh, whistleblower under the statute. And that was uh, clear and established whenever he participated in conversations with them. Mm -hmm.